So my, my next guest is a trustee of the University of Illinois, so the Board of Trustees that governs our University of Illinois system. Tammy Craig Schilling is also, uh, um, importantly for us, on the Research Park Board, and she is North America Knowledge Transfer Lead at Bayer, which Bayer is one of the companies that we're privileged to have here as a sponsor and in the Research Park. But Tammy has a really interesting story. And so today I ask that we talk a little bit more about her own personal journey to get into agriculture as a field, which started well before she was probably even born that she was predisposed to be there. Five generations of farming, Southern Illinois, and talk to us about Tammy. Growing up, what was it like to be in agriculture and what inspired you to continue in that career as you grew up and came to the University of Illinois? So my first memory of agriculture was showing sheep at three years old at the Ducoin State Fair. And um, I will tell you that growing up on a sheep and livestock farm is not the quickest way to get rich, but you live a rich life. And um, as a young person, I didn't know any different. I literally did not understand that friends of mine went swimming in the summer because we went to county fairs. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't think about that friends of mine didn't come home after school activities or running around on the weekends with friends and do the land check to make sure that the moms that were getting ready to have babies were okay. You know, that didn't hit me, like that not everybody did it because in my community, pretty much everybody had livestock of some kind. And then I got involved in 4-H, and that was really the first time that the block I came into my house was through extension. Every month we got our newsletter. Um, the newsletter was stuck up on, um, was stuck up on a refrigerator with a magnet, and my mom was a 4-H leader. And so, I mean, our lives really revolved around agriculture. But when I got to high school, um, in the eighth grade, I told my dad that I was going to be a cheerleader and wanted to try for student council, so was not going to take ag class. And if you knew my dad, he was about 350 pounds, 6'4", filled the door, and um, could run really fast still, was quite an athlete from the Newman area just south of here. And he said, uh, I really appreciate you thinking you have a choice, <laughs> but you don't and you are going to take agriculture class in high school one year. And at the end of one year, if you change your mind, we're good. Well, that was 35 and a half years ago, and I didn't change my mind. And through livestock judging contests um, on South Farms, I had the opportunity to come to the university, come to FFA convention that used to be at Assembly Hall, come to these experiences, and that's when I was recruited to come here to school. And that point, the next, the next phase was trying to explain to my parents that I was not going to Olney Central College, Olney Central College, the junior college, that I was coming to the University of Illinois. And my mother said, you are very ambitious, but we don't have money for you to go to school. We've given you love and skills and support and opportunities, but we don't have money. And literally, it was through the Jonathan Baldwin Turner program was the first scholarship I got. And it meant the world, right? Because it proved there's a path. And the second step was my dad was a veteran and had been in Vietnam and the child of a veteran tuition waiver. And at that point, I was, I was coming. And um, I had blue jeans with a line eye on the back. I had a hat. I had a coat. I had a scarf. I was coming to school here, and I did. Awesome. Well, I can't think of somebody who's a prouder Illini <laughs> than Tammy. And if you follow her at all, you'll see she's in orange all the time. So it was clearly impressionable. So she talked about 4-H and maybe FFA. Are there any former 4-H or FFA people in the room? I see some students here. Oh, we have a whole Woo bunch. Woo -woo. Okay, so maybe you showed animals. Maybe you can talk to Tammy more about your experiences. But one of the things that we've talked about is just the grit that's needed to do that. And I think it really taught you probably a lot of the hard work that was foundational in your career. So you were saying about, you know, that means getting up and taking care of animals early and on Wednesday nights going to show them. What's so hard about raising animals that people who have never done it don't know? 
Well, you know, Laura, that's a funny thing too because I've always done it. Um, I had to convert species, so when I married my husband, so my husband and I met at the Illinois State Fair. I mean, you want to talk about, like, my parents met at a county, well, they met going, my parents were in 4-H in Douglas County, Illinois, south of us, in Champaign, just south. They met going to the national, um, a national show in Chicago, when they used to have the big international event in Chicago. They then showed a sheep against each other at the county fair. My dad had started because of his ag teacher. My mother was multi-generational, you know, and my grandpa farmed crops. And I mean, it was like, I was destined to do this. And I mean, frankly, growing up in, you didn't have choices. You really didn't. You just, you go out and you do this because this is what you do. And you're committed to do it and you do it till you're done. And, um, so my husband and I, my husband farms full time in Oakville, Illinois. And if you know, if you are from Illinois and you like basketball, Oakville is really into basketball. Like we start in kindergarten competitively. My third grade granddaughter just played in a, two tournaments this week, this past week and a half. Um, but we also farm a lot. And there, there's something about that I mean, my son is a—he's a, a, a just coming a senior um, here right now, and he's going to go back to the farm. And one of the things that he used to talk about, one of the things that the coaches talked about was, um, like the—you just work till the job's done, and that's what we did at our our farm. That's what my husband and his family do. That's what, frankly, the many thousands of people I work with at Bayer—you work till the job's done. And it doesn't matter if it's early or late, and you work together and do it. And I really, I think that spirit flows through, and I think it, it shows up at the university. I mean, I, I, I've loved ch having Chancellor Jones with his background. Um, I think there's just something about that. And it, it doesn't mean you have to grow up on the farm to be like that. If, I mean, if you grew up in town, you can be like that too. It, but it is part of agriculture. And um, I think we're very fortunate in the U.S. that we have, because... If you're in South America, agriculture is the same. You have to work till it's done. But in many parts of the world, farmers don't have the voice. They don't have the support. They don't have the infrastructure that we have in the US. And I think that's one of the things that I, I love about, I feel very fortunate that I was born here and uh, get to be in this industry. <clears throat> So you talked about how going to the University of Illinois became very impactful in your life and go on to your um, wonderful career at Bayer that you'll tell us more about. Um, going to college is, was not a given, and um, at the University of Illinois, each year it's usually one in four or one in five students are first generation to go to college here. So we're a prestigious university, but we're also a place that gives access to those that might not otherwise have had higher education. And that happens through programs like Illinois Commitment and Illinois Promise that allow youth in the state of Illinois to come to college for free now. Um, but it also happens because we're a land-grant institution. And so Tammy's really passionate about that, of why the land grants mattered. We were one of the original 34, as we heard, but that was a really bold idea back in the 1800s. What does it mean to you as a trustee to think about being in leadership at a land grant? Why do land grants matter? Wow, I could literally... I could spend hours, uh, and I won't, um, but I could tell you why land grants matter. So, you know, in FFA, you learn about the Morrill Act and land grants in ag class. You learn about it in high school. Okay, so I learned about it, and that was cool, right? So then you come to the university, and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm at one. This is cool, right? The Jonathan Baldwin Turner program has a lot of history in land grants um, and, and being a real thought leader in that entire space. I mean, you know, if you, if you read the story, I mean, it's just a story of, you know, the East Coast had education, they had colleges, they had universities, but they were really that liberal arts. I mean, there was no place to do the hands-on engineering agriculture and business. I mean, we think about business being an East Coast thing, but business was really part, wasn't that original land grant, but became quickly, let's bring it into the country let's bring this education into the country and teach the vocational side. Well, so let me share with you how it's played out. I have had, uh, I've had been very fortunate to get to travel around the world and gone to um, every, every uh, all but two continents 
but and spent a lot of time with agriculture and farmers around the world, with media folks from around the world. And it hit me after a trip to Brazil that, one, they don't have land-grant universities. That was, the, that was the aha moment, right? I mean, I'm a small-town farm girl from Clay City, Illinois. Um, I didn't understand how other parts of the world, I never met people from other parts of the world until I went to college. And so I'm sitting in Brazil on a farm, and I'm like, where's the little town? Where's the little town that's around? Well, they don't have little towns around. They might have a, a no-till club. So we were down there we're in conservation tillage. They had a little no-till club that had a ball diamond and a community center. But they didn't have little towns. And so I began to think about, OK, why do we have little towns? Because little towns and land grants, to me, are just part of the infrastructure that I talk about in, in agriculture. Because I'm like, OK, why do we thrive? And Brazil has excellent agriculture, but they are not, they, they just don't have the years. They don't have the innovation. They're getting there, and they're great. I mean, the farmers there are just tremendous. But it is still, you know, it is still not quite the same. And I thought, why, why, what's going on? Like, why are there not ag people? Because I kept talking to the people that I worked at at Bayer. It was, I was Monsignor at the time, but I was talking to my peers. And, oh, I grew up in Sao Paulo. Oh, yeah, I grew up in Sao Paulo. Yeah, I grew up in Rio. South, and I'm like, where are the people that grew up in the small country in ag? Well, they're, they aren't really there. Because they didn't have railroads that had small towns. Because you needed a small town, so the railroad needed to stop in the US and have steam engines. You know, they had steam engines, so they had to stop every six miles. And you didn't have land grants that pushed education into the country. And Asia, same way. I had a woman from Indonesia who was a reporter. And she could not believe, I mean, she was completely flabbergasted at dinner when I explained to her that I worked at Monsanto in the city, I drove home to a farm, and my kids were educated in the local community and went to universities. She's like, oh, that doesn't happen in Indonesia. We built Jakarta and a few other cities, and the countries are, the country folk and the rural folk are just left to fend for themselves. Well, that's not how we do it here. And to me, the land grants, and one of the things that I tell people, and I told people long before I was a trustee and long, you know, extension is a gift that if we do not take care of ag extension and extension conceptually, we are doing our state and our country a huge disservice. Extension builds young people. It builds research, it builds mindset, it builds technology transfer. I mean, you want to talk about the ultimate technology transfer. It is extension. And that model does not exist in other parts of the world. And farmers are thriving, are, are just dying. I mean, they want content, they want information. I work with um, other knowledge transfer folks around the world. We have it. We have it through our land grant, we have it here. And we cannot let anyone take it away. And, and it's hard, right, when you've had something that long. But I mean, to me, land grants and railroads are part of what made America. USA. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we talked about the land grant also. Is it brought innovation in a way that was really important to our state. Um, this university, as we heard, was an early leader in both agriculture and engineering. So we've been doing ag innovation since we started 155 years ago. Well, Tammy, one of her expertise is human-centered design and really thinking about what the farmers, growers need around the world. And I think that's why she has a different perspective that she brings to bear. Uh, Bear has been a leader in a number of different fields. One of the things we were talking about is Climate Corp and how that mattered about weather data and how it's being used on a day-to-day -day basis. I thought, Tammy, you could tell us a little bit about, because you do go back to a farm at night and because you are married to a farmer, how does that shape and inform the way you lead a global corporation? Um, well, let me tell you, when prices go up at Bayer, my farmer husband ain't happy. <laughs> so it gets as basic as that. But I'll go back to, um, so I never have to check the ticker. 
I never have to check the prices online, where a lot of my peers do, right? They have to go on their phone and look at the corn price. I can tell you almost daily what the corn and soybean and wheat prices on the market. I can tell you what the basis is doing. I can tell you what policy is happening and how it impacts my husband. I can tell you, um, you know, whether it's equipment. You know, I mean, it's just when you are a farm wife, because that's what I am at, at night. I am a farm wife. I do not farm. I do not, I'm not allowed to drive the equipment unless it's just like, it's really bad. Um, and there's nobody else to do it. But it's just, it's, our, it's part of our life. You know, it's part of our life being a farm wife. But, but let me share with you something that I noticed. And, and it is really interesting because my husband, um, full blood German, uh, and, and some of you in the crowd know him. He's, I mean, he's pretty hardcore. Like when we got married, he said um, he was not using um, hybrids that Bayer sold. He was using soybeans, but not corn. And um, I was the sales manager for a big part of Illinois. And I, my sales reps were saying, well, if you can't sell your husband, how do you expect us to sell other farmers? So one night, we, um, he told me that the other company that he did business, the only company he did business with, that his family had like a 50-year relationship with, um, that he'd been by our farm. And we're friends with them, right? The, the, the dealer had been by our farm. And he said, yeah, I got my seed order in. And I said, oh, I said, that's, that's great. I said, uh, you, re you left me some room, right, to, to put a few bags out there? Oh, I guess I could put a couple bags out. And I said, okay, well, um, I really was thinking of more like a planter full, like a planter pass full, so 16 rows worth or something. He's like, <laughs> ain't going to happen on my farm. <laughs> and by the end of the evening, his comment to me was, you can run your company, but you ain't running my operation and I slept in the guest room. <laughs> he since is now 100%, but it was not because of me, it was because of technology. And I started to watch, you know, and so a lot of what I get to watch firsthand is how farmers make decisions. And keep in mind, in, the, in our community, all of our friends farm, all the people we go to school or go to church with farm, like our circle is farm people. And five, six years ago, I started to notice something. Well, it was probably more like eight years ago, frankly. So my husband um, did not like computers and did not want an iPhone and had one of those, remember those really big durable flip phones? I mean, they were like super durable and if you ran over them, sometimes they still worked and if not, they gave you a new one. My husband was a huge advocate of that. And he kept saying, we need to buy a few more so if mine goes bad that I can just change my SIM card. And I'm like, yeah, well, first of all, he didn't say SIM card. He wouldn't have known what that was. He called me this morning getting ready, and he's like, I need to search something in my email. How do I do that? Like, okay, one more time, I'm going to tell you how to search in your email. However, he got an, he got an iPhone, and he, he was like, this is amazing. I don't ever have to call 411 and get information for a phone number. This is like a great technology. I can look at farm bids. I can look at what's going on. I said, yeah. So then he got a laptop. And he'd cuss it, and he would hate it that it took so long to turn on and click the wrong button, have to go back, but it was on his lap every night. And then he got a new piece of equipment, farm equipment, and the dealer, it was actually our John Deere dealer, said, you know what, I know who your wife is. You're going to want to sign up for this thing called Climate Field View. And you are going to want to have access to this, so let's just go ahead and set it up, and you're going to need to buy an iPad. And he looks at him, and he's like, Oh, great. So he calls me and says, we got to go buy an iPad. That was eight years ago. That iPad never leaves his hands. We now, all of our cattle records on the iPad. We have barn cameras. He will get upset. So you know, like when you get a new, like a new iOS and you have to do the update. Well, you just have to do the same thing with, with apps, right? And you don't like to put your password in again, but you do, right? You, my husband got really mad after rain one time, and he threw the iPad at me, and he said, this piece of shit doesn't work. And I said, okay, well, well I mean, it's turned on. Oh, click the field view app. I can't get it open. I said, well, let's just put your login and your password in again. Well, I don't know what that is. I said, I do. I, let's get it. Let me get it for you. 
And he said, forget it. I don't even want to look at it. So I said, okay, I just set it aside, right? It was evening. I thought, I am not working for the company right now. I'm a farm wife. And the farm wife says, I'm not going to take this abuse. And I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. So he comes back, picks up the iPad, and he says, will you please let me get into field view? I need to see some things. <laughs> and it's been funny, Laura, to watch that. And then to work in agronomy knowledge transfer in this work and watch the trend. And the iPads, this, was, this data is two years old, but the iPad in agriculture, according to Farm Journal, uh, the Farm Journal research that they do, is the fastest growing individual technology in America, in farming. In about four to five years, more than 70% of farmers had iPads. I mean, that's pretty damn fast. And we went in, we had a, my husband had a colonoscopy. I had a colonoscopy. My husband did not. I did. So yeah, I mean, we're just telling it all, right? We're a very open, I'm a very open person. And um, I go into the doctor's office with him. He had to take me. And there were 12 people in the doctor's office, and two of the people had iPads. They were both farmers. One was a farmer from Carlinville that was a friend of ours. That's just like so weird. He was there with his parents. And my husband, that iPad never leaves his hand. It is a gateway. And my husband can use field view, and he can do all the things he needs to do in there, and he can draw the polygon around a field and compare two hybrids and look at the yield in that, in that space. Now, he can't search his email. No, no joke, but he can do that. And the technology grows because it helps him farm. Because I asked him, I said, why do you, you hate this machine. Why do you use it? And he said, I can't farm without it today. It's part of my farm, and it's a data point that I never had before. So Bayer, as a company, has helped really advance software that is making better decisions for farmers, allowing more precision. And you're thinking about advances for the future now that are going to be more dramatically thinking about what individual seeds, as you were saying, selling seeds, how that is in the exact place it should be. Can you give us a little preview of what's happening in seed companies, Bayer in particular, how are you going to make better yields for farmers by making more accurate decisions? Yeah, so we're doing it in a couple ways. So um, I've graduated with an ag communications degree. And let me tell you that people in agronomy, so I don't know how many of you maybe have the AgCom degree, but those of us that do feel a little inferior when our peers tell us, well, you didn't have to take chemistry. And I'm like, you're right, which is part of my reason to be an AgCom major. Um, Short-sighted, I must say, but still part of the reason. So to lead a group in agronomy, I, were, I was on our technology leadership team, um, worked for Dr. Fregley for several years, and was, was literally in the inside of the pipeline. And that was so awesome, having been on the end of the pipeline, seeing products come out for growers, and then to be on the very beginning, like the 10 years, 12 years down the road, and making decisions. I mean, I was voting, making decisions about whether we should address aphid problems, and when we bought the Climate Corporation that's now part, part of Digital um, Field Solutions. And, and it was really interesting, because I also could bring a farmer perspective to that. But one of the things I'm, I'm excited about today is the, the merging of human-centered design or farmer-centered design, digital tools and technologies and innovations, and the good old basics of plant breeding. And when we call it plant, plant breeding 3.0. At Bayer, that's what we call it. Because it's this, it's almost a design, well, it's not almost, it is a, a, a designer hybrid, not designer blue jeans, but designing hybrids for the needs of growers in a different way than we never have before. And we're using crowdsourcing data. We're using information that's available to all kinds of people. But looking at doing this differently. And when you think about a grower and the challenges that a farmer is facing, whether it's the crops they grow, you've got to, if you start with them and understand their experience and what experience do they want to have, and how does the digital experience enhance the human experience and blending those two? And then how do you build products for that? And how do you build information delivery for that? And we literally have developed what we call an agronomy calendar, agronomy wheel. And we've um, done data mining with our own um, agronomy information as well as lots of agronomy information online. And we know 
per region of the country and Canada, which I'm responsible for, we know which topics in agronomy are the most important at any point in time. And it's really interesting because you think, okay, well, that's really simple, right? Well, I mean, we hadn't done it. We hadn't done it in our, my career. And when we started doing it, we now are so much better at being proactive and planned. And we also, because we've got that on kind of an automated approach, which, which still our field people can go in and change that, but it's, so it's that ground truth and automation at the same time. But then our people can worry about, are we gonna have a weather event? Uh, October 9th, a couple years ago, we got a huge freeze. So we were able to then deploy information very quickly about, okay, what do you do when it's snowing on your soybeans and you're ready to harvest? How do you deal with it? What do you do? And farmers, farmers will tell you, my husband tells me this, I don't keep all of that stuff in my mind because you have it and you're going to provide it to me. I don't have to fill my mind with that. I have enough to think about with taxes, running the operation, keeping things going financially, but I know you have it. And so that's what I'm excited about is how do you do genetics different and how do you do information different and how do you use all the tools and technologies and people to make it happen? I think Tammy showed you really the authenticity that can occur here in Illinois. And when you take a farm girl and turn her into somebody in a leadership role at a major global company of thinking about what really serves the needs of farmers. So we're excited that Bayer has an innovation center here in the research parks that's giving the students that opportunity as well. I don't know if Blake Giles is here who leads that center, but um, we have a lot of great students who get the chance to work from Bayer. So if you're interested in being a part of this exciting field, please talk to Tammy or somebody else from Bayer and um, as you can tell, she'll, in, she'll be helping to inspire you, I think, and she's a very proud Illini. So thank you so much for being a trustee and serving us at the Research Park as well on our board. Thank you, Tammy. Thanks, Laura.